Hi there. Um, welcome back to the veterinary online vet, vet tech online review course for the VTNE prep. We are continuing on with anatomy and physiology, and we're at 2.5 digestive and urinary, and this is the second lecture in the 2.5 section, and it is specifically the urinary system. So the body relies on many metabolic reactions to keep it alive. These chemical reactions result in many byproducts, and some are useful for our body and some um, and get recycled, but then some of them are like garbage and there's no required use for them at all. And they actually can be harmful if they accumulate in the body. Okay, so these are called waste products. So again, these waste products are made by different chemical reactions that happen in our body, and then they create this byproduct that can be either useful or garbage. And these garbage ones are waste products, and they have to be eliminated. For example, fat metabolism. So when we met metabolize fat, um, it actually creates carbon dioxide, which needs to be eliminated from our body. It creates water and um, red blood cell breakdown and um, oh sorry red blood cell breakdown being another example which actually red blood cell, red blood cell breakdown actually creates bile salts and um, tissue breakdown if we have to have tissues that are going to um, metabolize within our body it's, it can um, it can create various salts so these are all chemical reactions that happen in our body and the byproduct, there's going to be there's going to be a byproduct made, either it's useful or it's garbage. So, the body has several ways to get rid of the waste products due to this metabolism that happens inside our body, and um, our respiratory system. Remember, I said that fat metabolism, uh, one of the byproducts, is carbon dioxide, and the respiratory system actually removes the carbon dioxide as well as the water vapors that comes out of our respiratory system. Our sweat glands eliminate various salts, water, and a small amount of urea. Our digestive system removes bile salts and digestive wastes. And then our urinary system, which this lecture is about, and this removes urea salts, water, toxins, and other soluble waste products. So the urinary system is the most important route of waste product removal. So all because of the metabolism that happens in our body, all these waste products, the urinary system is the most important way to get rid of it. And it removes almost all soluble wastes from the blood. So let's try to understand the urinary system. There's different parts to the urinary system. It actually happens to be one of the more, more simplistic systems because there's four basic uh, structures. Now, <laughs> I say simplistic, but then when we get into the um, physiology of the kidney, it, it's, it can blow your mind. Um, but uh, when we're talking about what we're looking at right now, there's just four basic structures. Starts at the kidneys, goes down to the ureter, and then it collects all into the urinary bladder and then out the urethra. So let's start with the kidneys, the more complex aspect of the urinary system. The kidneys are actually located in the dorsal abdominal area, so they're ventral to and on either side of the first few lumbar vertebrae. Um, it's located in the retroperitoneal, or sorry, it's retroperitoneal to the abdominal cavity, which means it's outside of the parietal um, peritoneum. So the parietal peritoneum is what covers the abdominal cavity and right behind that tissue is where the, um, the kidneys lie and that's why it's called retroperitoneal, retro meaning behind or back. Um, so it lies between the peritoneum and the dorsal abdominal muscles. I do believe I have a picture showing this um, coming up. In most domestic animals, except for pigs, the right kidney is more cranial than the left. And we talked about in class how whenever we're looking at a radiograph, for example, and we're trying to figure out what, which side's right and which side is left, the easiest way to quickly determine that is look at the kidneys. Um, the left one is always left behind, which means it's going to be more caudal than the right one. Um, there's a thick layer of perirenal fat usually surrounding the kidneys to help protect them from the pressures uh, within the abdominal cavity and it's covered by a fibrous connective tissue capsule. This here is is what I was hoping that I had and um, it's showing you this is the abdominal cavity this is a cross section of it so if we're looking at our patient this is the back and under here is the belly 
okay? So we do a cross section of the abdominal cavity and this is what we're gonna see. This is the spine here. And the dotted line is showing you the parietal peritoneum. So this is a thin piece of tissue that, that lines the abdominal cavity, okay? And um, the, the kidneys, which are shown right here, are right outside of that parietal peritoneum. So right behind, so that's why it's called retroperitoneal. It's right behind it, and so this is the muscle here, the abdominal muscles. So it's between the muscles and that thin peritoneum. So the kidneys function, the main role is to eliminate metabolic waste materials from the body. Like we said, there's going to be um, certain chemical reactions that happen in our body, and the result of that are waste materials. So how does it do that? Um, the kidney maintains homeostasis through filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. And we're going to talk about these in the, in the coming slides. Blood is filtered. Useful substances are returned back into circulation, so that would have been a byproduct of the chemical reactions in our body that our body needs, or um, not even not even um, metabolic waste, but something as simple as water for dehydrated. Um, thankfully, our kidneys are able to suck that water back into our body from the kidneys. And also waste products are secreted from the blood into the fluid that will then become urine. Um, so that kind of breaks down the filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. The blood is filtered. The useful substances are reabsorbed into the blood so that it can go back into our body and get used. And then all the waste material, all the waste products and garbage gets secreted as urine. Um, it also, the kidneys also maintain homeostasis through fluid balance regulation. So if the body has excess water, the kidney will eliminate it by producing more urine. And this process is actually called diuresis. So increasing water intake, calling poly, um, sorry, causing polyuria is um, diure diuresis. If the body is dehydrated and needs to conserve water, less urine is produced. Um, and that's because of the reabsorption aspect of the kidneys. It'll reabsorb that water and use it in our body. All of this is controlled. Um, the fluid balance regulation is all controlled by the antidiuretic hormone, the ADH. So continuing on with its function, it also regulates um, acid base balance. So it helps maintain blood pH by removing acidic hydrogen and basic bicarbonate ions from the blood and excreting them in the urine. So it will help that blood pH. And it also, um, the production of hormones. So um, we did, it is associated with the endocrine system, although the kidneys aren't glands, they're actually an organ. The kidneys produce hormones, regulate the release of hormones from other organs, and are themselves influenced by a hormone. So for example, they influence the rate of ADH, the antidiuretic hormone secretion from the pituitary gland. And um, special cells in the kidney actually produce erythropoietin. We talked about erythropoietin when we were talking about um, blood formation. And that's what actually helps with blood formation is the erythropoietin that's produced by the kidneys. And then the very last one, um, blood pressure regulation. So kidneys contain internal receptors that monitor blood pressure. So hypotension, so low blood pressure causes the kidneys to secrete a hormone called renin. And this hormone will result in vasoconstriction and the retention of sodium and water, which will increase the blood volume. So this will help uh, regulate the, the pressure. So let's um, talk about the gross anatomy of the kidney before we get down into the microscopic anatomy of the kidneys. So um, this is uh, what the kidney would look like. Uh, to the left, you'll see companion animal kidneys. So this is dog, cat, your typical um, horse, you know, all the all your typical companion animals. The the only one that's really particular is the bovine kidney, the bone vine, and this is a normal bovine kidney. It actually has these segments, which is very um, different compared to our common uh, companion animals. So. Um, there's something called the hilus, which um, if you're looking from the outside of the kidney, you can see it on the right picture here um, depicted in green. The hilus is an indented area on the medial side of the kidney. So that means the inside um, 
more medial aspect of the kidney. And this is where the ureter, nerve, blood, and lymph vessels enter and leave the kidney. So that's where, that's the entrance and the exit to the kidney is the hilus. There's something called the renal pelvis, and it's um, a funnel-shaped area inside that hilus, and this is where the urine will collect to go down into the ureter, and these pictures will show you um, what they look like. Then we have the renal cortex and the renal medulla. So the renal cortex is the outer portion of the kidney, as you can see here. And to the left, you can see an actual dissection of a kidney, and you can very visibly see that cortex. And then the inside middle part is the renal medulla. And again, you can see that very visibly on those pictures. And then there's a calyx. The calyx is a cup-like extension of the renal pelvis into the medullary pyramids. Um, so there is a major and a minor calyx, plural is calyxes. So you can see them in this picture here. So basically it just extends from the renal pelvis and moves up into what we call the medullary pyramids. And these, this is one pyramid here, and this is another pyramid here, and this is another pyramid here. And um, so basically it's the extension that leads up into the pyramid. And these calyces actually act as a funnel to direct the fluid down into the renal pelvis so that it could go down the ureter and, and get urine uh, and go into the bladder. So let's talk about the microscopic anatomy of the kidney, and this is where things can get quite complex. So I really suggest going on, um, going back into your PowerPoints of your lecture notes and seeing those videos that we had posted, because I feel like those are um, really explanatory for these nephrons and the microscopic anatomy of the kidneys, which can get quite complex. So microscopic appearance of the kidney, the cortex and the medulla are filled with thousands of microscopic filtering and reabsorbing and secreting units. And these units, what we're talking about is the nephron. So the nephron is the basic functional unit of the kidney. It's how the kidneys work is thanks to this nephron. And over to the right here, that's a picture of one nephron. And these kidneys actually contain thousands of them. So it's the smallest part of the kidney. Um, a medium-sized cat will actually have 200,000 of these nephrons within one of their kidneys. Medium dog will have about 700,000. Humans have 1 million nephrons and amazingly enough cattle have 4 million nephrons found in their kidneys. That's pretty impressive. So the nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. Each nephron consists of a renal corpuscule, a proximal convoluted tubule, a loop of Henle, and a distal convoluted tubule. Now this picture here can look like quite a mess and be quite um, hard to wrap your brain around, but each one of these aspects we're going to cover right now. So let's talk about the renal corpus corpuscle. Corpuscule? Corpuscle. Um, it's located in the renal cortex, so the renal cortex was that outer layer macroscopically of that kidney. Its function is to filter blood in the first stages of urine production. Um, it's composed of two things, the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule, and the glomerulus is actually surrounded by the Bowman's capsule. And the glomerulus is actually made up of capillaries. So if you're looking here, this is the Bowman's capsule. And inside this Bowman's capsule, we have all these capillaries that are kind of intertwined in here. And that's the glomerulus. Fluid filtered out of blood is called the glomerular filtrate. So it'll get secreted out of these capillaries and brought into the Bowman's capsule to be brought further into the nephron. After that, um, it'll go into the proximal convoluted tubules. If you look on this picture here, we just talked about the glomerulus, which was a whole cluster of um, capillaries right here, and, and it's hugged by the Bowman's capsule. And so that's where blood filtration will initially start, and then we'll have the glomerular filtrate, which is what gets sucked out of the blood. And then it'll go down into the next structure, which is called the proximal convoluted tubule, which um, is, is shown right here in pink. So it is a continuation of the capsular space of the Bowman's capsule. It's lined with cuboidal 
epithelial cells with a brush border on the luminal side. It has a twisting path through the cortex. So again, we're still located in the cortex. If you can take a look at this picture here, you'll see the nephron. This is the cortex line here. So anything above here, so all of this is located within the cortex of the kidney. And then all of this is located in the medulla of the kidney. And then once the glomerular filtrate leaves the Bowman's capsule, it'll then call tubular filtrate because it goes into the proximal convoluted tubule and makes its way to the distal convoluted tubule. So it's tubular filtrate. So after the proximal convoluted tubule, it will um, go down into the loop of Henle. Okay, so if we take a look at this picture, we have our glomerulus here. The glomerular filtrate will make its way into the proximal convoluted tubule right here, where it's then considered tubular filtrate. And then that will descend down into this U-turn, which is called the loop of Henle. Um, so um, the descending loop has epithelial cells similar to the proximal convoluted tubule. We said those were copoidal epithelial cells. At the bottom of the loop, epithelial cells flatten to simple squamous cells and lose their brush border. And then the ascending loop, so the loop, um, the part of that U-turn that's going back up, becomes thicker again. So after that U-turn, after the loop of Henle, that tubular filtrate will make its way to the last part of the, the tubule, which is a distal convoluted tubule. So again, if we want to recap, we have our glomerulus right here. So it's uh, a whole bunch of capillaries going into this little catcher's mitt, which is called the Bowman's capsule. And then it's going to filter the blood. So it's going to it's going to take some uh, substances out of the blood. It's going to bring it down into here, which is the proximal convoluted tubule. Um, now it's turning into a tubular filtrate. And then it'll go down the loop of Henle, so down this U-turn and make its way back up here, and then it'll go into the distal convoluted tubule right here, which is depicted in yellow. So it is a continuation of the ascending loop of Henle. Um, the distal convoluted tubule from all nephrons in the kidney empty into, empty into the collecting ducts. So they will carry that tubular filtrate through the medulla and empty into the renal pelvis. And this is um, primary site of action of ADH and regulation of potassium and acid-base balance. Remember how we said that the kidneys play a role in the, the blood pH balance? Well, that'll happen here in the, in the distal convoluted tubule. So this is a diagram here. Um, again, it can get it can get quite overwhelming, but once you start understanding each bit and piece of the nephron, it should be easier. So we're looking at um, the kidney here. So we're taking off a chunk, and this is where the blood will come in to the glomerulus, uh, which is this cluster of um, capillaries here, which will filter out some substances from the blood, and it'll go into the Bowman's capsule, which is this catcher's mitt right here. It'll go into the proximal convoluted tube, tubule. So you can see there's some potassium that's uh, reabsorbed, um, some water, and then the it's tubular filtrate at this point. And then it'll go down this U-turn here where it'll go the descending loop of Henle and the ascending loop of Henle all the way back up to the distal convoluted tubule. And then remember how we said the distal convoluted tubule will dump its contents into the collecting duct? This is the collecting duct right here. And this leads down to the renal pelvis and as it goes down here it'll actually turn into actually what we call urine right so it'll come down here dump into the renal pelvis where it's then considered urine and go down out the ureter and down into the bladder so hopefully this this makes sense so how do kidney get its blood supply so the renal artery enters the kidney at the hilus. Remember the hilus was that um, the enter and the exit to the kidney. And that's where all nerves and blood vessels and everything go in and out of the kidney. So the renal artery, which we know arteries are vessels that are leaving the heart, and um, it'll go in at the hilus and divides into, smart, into smaller arteries called arterioles. So whenever we talk about afferent or efferent vessels, afferent is something that's going away 
from or sorry to a structure and then efferent is something that's going away from in the nervous system we talk about afferent nerves and efferent nerves and a good way to remember that efferent nerves or arterioles are leaving a structure is e is for exit e is for efferent so e exits <coughs> so excuse me so that's a, a good way to remember that. So afferent glomerular arterioles carry blood into the glomerular capillaries of the renal corpuscule. So remember, we kept talking about this is the glomerulus here, which is a whole cluster of capillaries. And these arterioles are going to bring yummy oxygenated blood down into the glomerulus. Um, and the glomerular capillaries filter some of the plasma out of the blood and put it into Bowman's capsule, right? That's that filtration that we were talking about. And, um, and then it'll turn into glomerular filtrate. And then afferent glomerular arterial or eff efferent glomerular arterioles receive blood from the glomerular capillaries and bring it back out. So efferent glomerular arterioles divide to form the peritubular capillaries. So it's not as easy as going into the glomerulus and then leaving the glomerulus and that's all it does because it actually has further function than that. So the efferent, once it does leave the glomerulus, it has more work to do. So um, it'll surround the rest of the nephron and oxygen transfer to the cells of the nephron takes place here and tubular reabsorption and secretion also happens here in the in the arterioles that come out of the glomerulus and then wrap around the nephron so this is a beautiful picture showing exactly that so remember our arteries are depicted in red so we have our afferent arterioles going in here to our glomerulus and the and and the blood in here the plasma is actually going to get absorbed out and then go into the Bowman's capsule and then it'll turn into glomerular filtrate and then we have our efferent arteriole which then leaves it but it doesn't leave the kidney it then goes back down here and totally zigzags its way around the nephron and again the red is an arteriole which contains oxygenated blood and then and once it makes its way here, it has deoxygenated blood and it'll make its way into the vein to go back up to the heart because um, now it's deoxygenated. But this is a beautiful depiction of how these blood vessels will just zigzag and intertwine around that nephron. And that's how um, the, the, the filtration, secretion, reabsorption um, all happens between the nephron and the blood. And now you can actually see visually how that happens. The nephron is going to... Um, is going to reabsorb and secrete things and it does it because it's really in close contact with these capillaries that are hugging that are hugging it so the peritubular capillaries converge to form venules and then larger veins and then final, finally the renal vein, like I said, and, and that's obviously going to, we know that veins are going towards the heart and uh, typically, typically carry deoxygenated blood. The renal vein leaves the kidney at the hilus, remember the hilus is the entrance and the exit for the kidney for anything, and joins the abdominal portion of the caudal vena cava, which then makes its way back up to the heart to get reoxygenized. <clears throat> so now the the function um, you know let's talk about that we talked about filtration reabsorption secretion and excretion but let's um, talk about how that really happens so mechanism the mechanism of action the kidneys have three main mechanisms for waste elimination we mentioned them well, it was the filtration of the blood remember that happens in the glomerulus which is this picture that's showing you down here you can see this is a glomerulus in here and it does the filtration so that plasma is going to leave the glomerulus and go into the Bowman's capsule and then it's going to turn into um, glomerular filtrate and that's the very very beginning of the filtration then there's reabsorption and this is when there's something useful that's that that that's in that filtrate and then it will go back into our blood so that our body can actually use it we don't want that stuff excreted if it's useful and our body knows that so it's going to reabsorb all of those great things that we need back into our blood system so our body can use it and then the rest that's garbage will um, it's it, it goes under secretion which is the mechanism mechanism of action um, to get rid of waste products 
So the filtration of blood happens in the renal corpuscle. We said that, right? So the glomerular capillaries contain many large fenestrations in the capillary endothelium. So remember that cluster of capillaries that um, makes up the glomerulus. Those capillaries have fenestration, so little tiny holes in them. Now those holes are not large enough to let the blood cells out or big proteins. It just lets that plasma through those little tiny fenestrations in the capillaries in the in the glomerulus. So high blood pressure that, that glomerulus is under high blood pressure and it forces that plasma out of the capillaries and into the Bowman's capsule. And then like we said, um, it'll make glomerular filtrate. So glomerular filtration rate is how fast the plasma is filtered through the glomerulus. And the glomerular filtrate then leaves the Bowman capsule and travels through the convoluted tubules in the loop of Henle, which then turns into tubular filtrate. So um, let's talk about reabsorption. We talked about filtration that happens um, in the glomerulus in the Bowman's capsule, okay? So that's where the filtration of blood happens, but the reabsorption, so in the glomerular filtrate, there are waste products, but there's also molecules that the body needs back, like sodium, potassium, calcium, glucose. These are these can all be beneficial things for our body. So the process, is, the process of the body taking back these useful mo molecules is called reabsorption. So substances to be reabsorbed absorbed pass out of the tubular lumen so remember we mentioned that it goes from the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule into the proximal convoluted tubule so it'll actually be reabsorbed out of the proximal convoluted tubule um, uh, through or between the tubular epithelial cells and it'll go out and make its way back to the blood circulation Substances to be reabsorbed then enter the interstitial fluid. So it leaves the lumen of that tubule, so the, the epithelial cells of the proximal convoluted tubule. Those yummy substances, those yummy molecules that our body needs are going to leave that lumen, make its way into the interstitial fluid because there's no direct passage from the capillaries to the, the nephron. So it actually goes into the interstitial fluid and passes through the endothelium of the peritubular capillaries. So remember the peritubular capillaries are all hugging that nephron so they make their way out of the tubule through the space, the interstitial space, and then back into the peritubular capillaries which will then bring it back into our blood circulation. 65% of tubular filtrate is reabsorbed at the proximal convoluted tubule. Um, 80% of the water, sodium chloride and bicarbonate is reabsorbed and 100% of the glucose and amino acids is reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubules. So this diagram here is showing you that process of reabsorption, okay? So basically what we have here is we have our tubule here, okay? And um, so these molecules, for example, we have sodium here and water here, they're, and they're going to take on different ways to get through. This is the, the lumen, the wall of our tubule. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen through different ways. There's going to be different cellular, there's going to be different proteins in this wall that's going to bring these molecules through it. Um, again, we're not going to focus on that right now, but you can see the um, water goes through the lumen. This is the interstitial space that I was telling you about, and then it'll travel that way, make its way to the peritubular capillaries that are hugging that nephron, and make their way back into circulation where those molecules will then go through our body and be used. Um, wherever it needs to be used. So sodium reabsorption specifically in the tubular filtrate attached to a carrier protein that moves it um, into the cytoplasm of the proximal convoluted tubule epithelial cell. Now this is what I was telling you about. Sodium, water, potassium, all these things are going to diffuse through the wall of that tubule differently. And the sodium specifically attaches to a carrier protein that moves it excuse me, into the cytoplasm of that cell. Glucose and amino acids attach to that same carrier protein and follow sodium into the cell by passive transport. So they kind of hitch a ride. So sodium is actively pumped out of the cells into the interstitial fluid, like we said, where it moves into the capillaries. Glucose and amino acids move from the tubular, the 
proximal convoluted tubule cell into the interstitial fluid and then into the capillaries by passive diffusion. Again, just hitching a ride with that sodium. So sodium ions are also reabsorbed in the ascending loop of Henle and the distal convoluted tubule. So it's not just in the proximal convoluted tubule, usually exchange of hydrogen, ammonium, and um, potassium ions, usually exchanged for. So they'll exchange the, the sodium ions for hydrogen, ammonium, and potassium. Um, potassium and calcium reabsorption takes place in the proximal convoluted tubule, the ascending loop of Henle, and the distal convoluted tubule as well. So calcium moves um, from the filtrate under the influence of vitamin D, parathyroid hormone, and calcitonin. So these are all very important hormones and vitamins that will aid in that filtration. Um, magnesium is reabsorbed from the proximal convoluted tubule, the ascending loop of Henle, and the collecting duct. Chloride. Um, diffuses from the tubular filtrate into the epithelial cells and interstitial space in response to electrical imbalance uh, created by sodium removal. So you're going to have that chloride diffusion when we have the removal of sodium. Some of the water in the filtrate moves into the interstitial space and peritubular capillaries by osmosis once sodium, glucose, amino acids, and chloride have left the tubular filtrate. So we're just going to inevitably have that water um, move into the interstitial into those capillaries by osmosis. Now for secretion. So the secretion, we talked about filtration, reabsorption, and now finally secretion. So secretion primarily happens in the distal convoluted tubule. So it's the tubule at the furthest end of the nephron, right before the collecting duct. Hydrogen, potassium, and ammonia are eliminated by secretion. Some medications are also eliminated from the body by secretion. So this picture here is showing you um, secretion going from the capillaries in uh, through the tubular space into the tubule, which will then turn into water, or sorry, urine. Now for the rest of the urinary system, we spend so much time talking about the kidneys because they're so amazing and so intricate. And then uh, we're going to go down to the more simple structures of the urinary system, uh, the ureter, the bladder, and the urethra. So um, again, at the hilus area, it's the exit and entrance for everything into the kidneys and the ureters will leave at this area. The ureters have an outer fibrous layer, a middle smooth muscle layer, and an inner layer lined with transitional epithelial cells. So the transitional epithelium allows the ureters to stretch as urine passes through them on its way down to the urinary bladder. Smooth muscle layer propels urine through ureter by peristaltic contractions. The ureters enter the urinary bladder at an oblique angle, and when the bladder is full, it collapses the opening of the ureter, preventing urine from backing back up into the ureter and going back towards the kidneys. We can't have that happen, right? So um, when that bladder is full, it'll collapse the opening, and you can see that demonstrated on this picture here. Now, um, for the urinary bladder, it's lined with transitional epithelial cells, um, and typically when doing urinalysis, we'll see those transitional epithelial cells that have sloughed off from the wall of the bladder. And um, they stretch as the bladder becomes filled with urine. The wall of the urinary bladder contains smooth muscle bundles. Um, neck of the bladder extends caudally from the sac into the pelvic canal and joins with the urethra, which you can see there on that picture. Around the neck of the urinary bladder, there are circular muscles composed of skeletal muscle fibers. So that, that gives us our capability of being able to hold our urine. So micturition or uresis is terms used uh, for the expulsion of urine from the urinary bladder into the urethra. So micturition is the actual act of urinating. Urine accumulates until the pressure of the filling of the bladder activates stretch receptors within the bladder wall. And that'll give us our sensation of having to urinate. Um, a spinal reflex, uh, sorry, a spinal reflex returns a motor impulse to the bladder muscle, causing them to contract. Contraction gives the sensation of having to urinate. Voluntary control of the muscular sphincter around the neck of the bladder results in temporary control of urination. Again, you can only, you can only control that sphincter for so long before your bladder fills to the point where it's just going to happen. 
So um, moving down from the bladder and past that sphincter that we have temporary control over, it will go, the urine will go down into the urethra. So this is a continuation of the neck of the urinary bladder, which leads down into the urethra. It carries urine from the urinary bladder to the external environment, and it's lined with transitional epithelial cells, which allow it to expand. Now this, this, uh, this is an interesting picture that I wanted to put here because we often talked in class about the, pro the prostate gland which is an accessory sex gland so basically reproduct it has reproductive function so it um, adds the fluid that the sperm will um, will transfer in and uh, the prostate gland is located right here by the urethra and we talked about in class um, how with an enlarged prostate it can actually affect your urinary system so um, making it very hard to urinate so this can give you a good appreciation for that you can see where the prostate lies as opposed to the bladder and the urethra so if this gets inflamed and starts pinching off the urethra you can appreciate how that would definitely cause dysuria so the female urethra is shorter and straighter uh, than the long curved male urethra. Now, um, in the female, the urethra opens on the ventral portion of the vulva. In males, the urethra runs down the central, um, the center of the penis, and also functions um, in the respiratory, in, sorry, in the reproductive system. So, semen will also be um, exited, will also exit through the urethra as well as urine from the urinary system.